everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash and this is episode 28 in the podcast series. Uh, you are most welcome here. If you are new, it's nice to see you. And of course, all the old friends, welcome back. Nice to see you all. Um, you can find me just about everywhere as Knitting the Stash on Ravelry and Instagram, on YouTube, obviously, and on the blog, which is knittingthestash.wordpress.com. Uh, it's nice to be with you today. This is a, uh, for anyone who's new, this is a podcast that's about knitting and spinning uh, and largely about DIY modifications, like how to make craft and uh, making accessible so that you get the end results that you want. Um, today's episode is called Worn Thin, <laughs> and I'll explain that in a minute. It will also feature a little cameo by our new puppy named Tink. Uh, we did adopt a puppy last weekend and her name, I mean, the thing that kind of sealed the deal was that her name was Tink, which is a knitting technique, you know, right, to tink back, uh, which is knit in reverse, right? It's like, it couldn't really have been more uh, karmically kismet or whatever it is, right? Perfect. So uh, I will get a little segment in here about Tink the puppy so that you can uh, see her in all her crazy glory. Right now she's sleeping downstairs. My family is being very, very generous this morning and uh, giving me a few minutes up here to uh, cast with you all. So I'm so thankful to them uh, for always being supportive of this knitting and spinning uh, life that I live on the side. <laughs> um, so in today's uh, cast, I have um, a little uh, discussion of being worn thin uh, in terms of having knitting wear thin. Uh, not me. I'm I'm creative comeback. I'm ready to go. You know, after the survival knitting of the semester, I'm I'm doing pretty well. My semester's over, so I'm this this. When I talk about being worn out, it's more about the knits being worn out. Uh, I have a finished object spin for you. Uh, I have uh, Spencer's sweater, which I'll talk about uh, how that's going so far. Uh, and a little bit of in the mail and an awesome uh, collaboration that's coming up with LB Hand Knits that you'll want to stay tuned for. Um, let's see what else have we got going on. A tiny bit more about the remake project that I mentioned last time and a giveaway for all of you 4 ounce challengers. Uh, I have a couple winners who are going to win a pattern of, of their choice from Ravelry. So exciting stuff on the podcast today. Lots and lots going on. This first segment of the podcast is about being worn thin and just a couple words um, of things I've been thinking about because our knitting is often so precious to us and it's something that, I mean, at least to me, it's something that I, when I first started knitting, I uh, would basically keep things on a shelf or in a bin and rarely wear them. I'd give them to people and if other people wore them and wore them out, that was fine, but I couldn't bring myself to like wear a sweater that I had made or a shawl or even a hat because I was just like, oh, it's, it was so precious, you know, as a, as an object, even though I'm a process knitter, it's kind of weird. Um, and then slowly over the last year, since I've been knitting so many sweaters and so many garments and things, um, I've been much more apt to wear them. And I found that I love wearing them and they're wonderful and they're warm and they're just like, they fit me and they're, they're great. Um, as most of you probably already, <laughs> already have experienced, right? Um, but in wearing things, you often wear them out and they get worn thin. I know Spencer has a couple pairs of socks with holes in them. Um, and we've got a bunch, all my blankets, my one year, one blanket projects are all downstairs on the couch and I fully expect them. I mean, my son drags around my Hue Shift Afghan all the time on the heating vent. You know, now there's a puppy downstairs. I, I have every reason to believe that these are going to be destroyed. And I'm, I'm kind of like coming to terms with that. And that's part of, um, I guess what having a new puppy around has made me think a lot about is, is the value of our knitting and the fact that it's really important to just use it and wear it and enjoy it and so what if it gets holes in it? You know, it's like, I think we have a model in a kind of modern contemporary day where um, our hand knits are these beautiful precious objects that, you know, I don't know, they're, they're meant to be on a shelf or something sometimes, in my mind at least. But then I think about the history of knitting and all the ways that, you know, women especially were um, producing these garments and these gloves and hats and sweaters and everything for, for their, their families to wear out in the winter and the cold and to be warm and to be used and get holes in and be darned. And I'm kind of embracing that philosophy a lot more right now, especially having a puppy. Um, and I found a sweater with some holes in it this weekend. And I, like I said, Spencer's socks have holes. So it's just, it's kind of like, it's a shift. It's a slow shift to kind of embracing 
the fact that knitting is also beautiful when it's worn out because it has been worn and loved and used and that's awesome. That said, since we do have the puppy downstairs <laughs> right now, I am not wearing any of my wool sweaters down there because uh, she's already uh, inadvertently ripped a couple holes in jeans and uh, I have this one kind of uh, ratty sweatshirt that I wear with her so that if she needs to gnaw on the cuffs or whatever it is, like that's fine. I want her to feel like all positive about it. I don't want her to feel negative and I don't want to feel stressed about it. So I just put my hand knit sweaters away and uh, that's fine until she's a little bit older. But it's gotten me thinking about knitting and, and having knitting be worn out and have that be, having that be okay. So if, if I can pass on that <laughs> thought to you today in this winter where you might want to, you might be tempted to kind of leave your woolens on their shelf and just look at them and think they're beautiful. Like break them out, wear them, why not? You can always knit another one, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole purpose of this whole thing. Um, and I do promise there will be a puppy segment later. <laughs> She's sleeping right now, so I'm gonna let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> Um, okay, so next segment is a finished object for you. This is a spin um, that I just did over the last couple of days. I'm dropping the tags. Um, Jade of So Perfect Pearls sent me some beautiful fiber with her um, Knit Together Project Square. And this is a merino bamboo, which is really quite beautiful. Let's see if you can see that. Um, for, and this, she featured this in episode um, 27 of her podcast, and this is called Forest Floor, and I think you can probably see why. It's this beautiful kind of green, um, dark green, little bits. It, it's almost like mossy or lichen or something like you'd find on the forest floor. Really, really beautiful. And so this is, um, this is from Jade of So Perfect Pearls. So first of all, Jade, thank you so much for sending this beautiful fiber along for me to try out. Um, I spun it up. Uh, it, since it's a merino bamboo, I spun it at a pretty high twist, high ratio, uh, and then I uh, chain plied it. So this is the finished skein of yarn, little mini skein tester, so you can see. And I thought that the um, so many of the beautiful greens and the kind of uh, different shades kind of came out so beautifully in this yarn. It has a kind of opalescent quality to it. Um, it's not it's not heathered it's kind of, it's like shimmery in part because of the bamboo um, I just want you to kind of see this it's really quite beautiful there you go and it's chain plied so it's a three ply and uh, I will say spinning this fiber if you ever have a chance to spin some so perfect pearls fiber from Jade it was like butter I mean it was like freshly prepared um, didn't need much fluffing or prep or anything to make it just just so spinnable. I mean, I was just sitting there. It was like I've spun lately some fiber that was not easy, and you're kind of tugging at it. It's a little felt. It's a little. Uh. This fiber is just it's it's incredible. The preparation of it and the um, the sheen on it, the colors, and it just it just drafted like nobody's business. Like I was barely even I barely even had to do anything, and it was just drafting out. Um, it's also it was also really tough. Um, because of the bamboo, like a hardy kind of, it produced a kind of hardy yarn because of the bamboo in there, I think. Um, really strong. And if I were to um, have a bigger bump of this, um, I think she sent about two ounces. If I had a bigger bump of this, maybe four or eight ounces, I would totally make socks out of this yarn and do a two or three ply, um, standard three ply, not a chain ply. Uh, and do some socks out of this. Now the reason I say I wouldn't do a uh, chain ply for socks is that chain plied yarn, um, as many of you know, you take a single and you kind of wrap it back on itself as you go. Um, and so you end up with three plies, but it's just the single that's been wrapped back on itself. So it creates these little knots um, as, you, as you're going along. So if you were to open up this yarn and kind of feel it really carefully, you could feel those places where the fiber overlaps itself. Um, and for, Socks or any kind of uh, garment that you're, or accessory that you're um, going to wear a lot and it's going to experience a lot of um, friction, you wouldn't necessarily want a chain ply because if, if one of the plies breaks in a chain ply, there's nothing else there to secure it. Whereas if you have an actual traditional three ply, you have three whole strands or three whole singles of yarn going in the same direction. So if one breaks, you've still got two left that will support whatever's going on and the unraveling is a lot less. Whereas if you break a ply here, they're all connected. 
so the minute you break one it just it's not as strong for that kind of thing um so but i but this fiber is very strong because of the merino bamboo combo that jade's got going on there um and so i would love 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 to take a bump of this and make a traditional three ply and make a pair of socks out of it because i think it would wear really really well um, and it's just shimmery and soft and it's just got all those good qualities that you want for a pair of socks so that was exciting to be able to get that done <laughs> kind of quickly and in between um, and jade thanks for sending along the fiber it's beautiful both the color the the preparation the spin on it is just really gorgeous so totally check out jade um so perfect pearls check out our podcast and um if you can get over to her etsy shop you won't be disappointed um, beautiful stuff there uh okay so that's my <laughs> that's my finished object for the week this is a kind of half finished object but this is my work in progress this is spencer's sweater i'm gonna try to switch over i think you can see it Yes, so this is just the back. This is the back of the sweater, one panel of it. Um, and this is the Denali pattern by Nora Gone. And uh, it's a pieced sweater, so you make the front, the back, or the back, the front, the sleeves separately, and then you seam them all together. Um, and it's a heavily cabled pattern. I showed it to you up close last time. I think you can see it in the light there. So there's a, um, there's a, a bone chart here, braid chart, bone, and then, you know, it goes across. It's kind of um, nicely symmetrical with the one um, bone chart in the middle. Totally cabled. You gotta love that, right? Um, and I talked about the stress with the ribbing in the last couple of episodes, so I won't redo that here, but you can see how this has come out. Um, and this I did uh, wash and block so that it is re uh, blocked to the right measurements. As you guys know from a couple episodes ago, this sweater was giving me fits because of the sizing. I'm using a, a different yarn than the pattern calls for. The pattern calls for um, Brooklyn Tweed Shelter, I believe. And I'm using a uh, Snailden yarn, which is a beautiful yarn that comes from uh, the Faroe Islands uh, and is in the Grease. And I talk about that back in the In the Grease episode. Uh, and because I'm using a different yarn, I was having a lot of trouble with the resizing of this, um, in, in part because it begins with a twisted, um, twisted rib on the bottom. Uh, but it all worked out, and I, when I blocked it, it blocked to almost exactly the right size, so that's great. Uh, and to block it, I used these um, T-pens, and I will tell you, I think I've made this recommendation on, my, on the blog before, but I'll tell you here. Uh, you can buy about... 10 T-pins <laughs> from, say, like, Knit Picks or one of these other stores for this tiny little box of pins, which will take you about, like, three square inches on a sweater, right? Or you can go to big box store, big box office store, like <clears throat> Staples, and uh, I picked these up at Staples. Huge box of pins. I mean, look at this. I think there are 100 in here. Yeah, there are 100 in here. Look at this. Massive pins. Cheap, right? Uh, I'd highly recommend doing that instead of buying the little specialty pins. Same pins, just about. Um, so I use those to block this on a towel on the floor in here away from the puppy. <laughs> and I'm gonna lower this guy down just a little bit so that you can see the top. Okay, I've got it pinned on the back of my mannequin right now because the front of my mannequin is more uh, has a more womanly figure, <laughs> let's just say. Um, so you can see the, uh, the armholes here are pretty interesting. Uh, it's a shaped decrease over here. Um, it's kind of like a steep decrease, a less steep decrease, um, working some things straight up here, and then it has a sloped shoulder bind off, which you can't quite see, I don't think on the camera, but it slopes down like this. And the pattern is super interesting. Um, if mo As most of you know, when you're making sweaters, it's always a good idea to add kind of like short rows or something in the back to raise the level of the back up so that the back is a little longer than the front, and that allows the front to kind of sit down like this one does. Uh, if you don't do that, it could have a tendency to like choke you out. So, how do you do that with a full panel of cables? It's a little tricky, but Noragon has a cool solution, and you'd have to get her pattern to find out about it, but um, later on you'll see, and it involves adding a little bit of action up here at the top before putting the collar on. So, I'm, I was... I was a little skeptical about how that pattern was going to work out, but I'm seeing it now. I can actually see how it'll work. Um, the other thing you could do if you're curious is go on Ravelry, 
check out the Denali Noragon pattern. Uh, some other folks have posted their versions of it, and what they've done is laid out the pieces of the sweater flat on the floor with the sleeves, and you can actually see how it goes together, which is it's a really, really cool construction. Um, so, modifications on this one. I've already told you about the um, resizing because of the yarn. Uh, the other thing, because of the resizing, I only have about six stitches on the side here, which is the stockinette portion. And the, um, the pattern calls for a much wider kind of sideband. Uh, and the wider sideband, as I said last time, allows you to then eat in for your shoulders just on that sideband and not into the cables. Um, but because of the way that I've set this up, I wanted to maintain the cables in the center, so I have, because my yarn is chunkier, I have a smaller sideband, and so I did eat into the cables for the shoulder here. But you can see, I think, that it worked out just fine. And uh, since I'm eating into the bone chart, it's much, these are uh, one by one cables, kind of over here, and modified one by one. Um, parts of them, <laughs> parts of them are four by four. It's complicated. Um, but it's easy, they look like one by ones, and so when you eat into the pattern, it, um, it doesn't cause as much disruption as it would if you were trying to eat into the um, braid pattern, which is a much more chunky five by five cable cross. Um, so that involved a lot of math and modification, and what I did for this sweater, which is something that's a little different than some of the other sweaters I've done, um, is when you do a uh, modification to a sweater, oftentimes you have to um, do math. Um, to figure out what the original pattern looks like, how it's how it's built, how it's conceived of, all the way through the pattern, so that you can then go back and modify it to the elements. And I have a, a video up about um, sweater math that might be helpful um, if anybody's interested in kind of hearing more about that. Um, but with this sweater, instead of just doing straight sweater math, I also did proportion, because uh, there's a lot going on with the construction of the sweater, as I said, and so it's less about numbers of stitches and more about proportion. So I did a lot, a little bit of like algebraic math to try to, you know, figure out if, you know, uh, 39 to 180 is X to 150 or whatever it was, you know, to try to figure out what the proportion was. Um, and I think it turned out really quite nicely. Um, and I feel happy about the proportion here. Um, what I need to do now is I've started on the front and for the front, I've decided that instead of doing just six stitches on the side, I've added an extra inch to each side. So I added an extra 10 stitches total um, for my cast on, so instead of 107, I'm doing 117. Keep in mind that the original pattern calls for 139 cast on, so it's definitely different. Um, so with the front, I've added an extra inch of stockinette to each side, and that'll just help me close up the side panels a little bit. Um, if I was worried, as I said last time, that this wouldn't block out to be the right size, which it did, um, and if it hadn't, and if, if it still doesn't work, I can always um, add stockinette strips kind of under the arms here to add a little bit of um, circumference to the sweater. But I don't think I'll need to because what I'm doing is adding just an extra inch to each side of the, the front, uh, front panel of the sweater. So I think that'll work out. So that's Spencer's sweater modifications so far. Hopefully next time I cast you guys, uh, there will be a front panel and maybe some sleeves. You never know. There's some car trips in our future and we'll see how the puppy does and whether or not I get to knit and that's uh, that'll determine a lot of it I guess. Um, but that's the modification though so far on this sweater and I'm really happy with it. I love the way that um, when it washed, I washed it in kind of lukewarm water, not too hot because I didn't want to wash out any of the lanolin that's left in this yarn. Um, lukewarm water um, with just some um, like you know wool wash kind of soap that you don't have to rinse out and it is it's still tough and a little bit um, rough and tumble, but it's much less like a piece of armor like it was before. Uh, it's softened up quite a bit, and you can see that the drape is actually pretty nice. It's going to be pretty nice, I think, um, on the sweater. I've just got it pinned up here in two different places, and you can see how it's kind of hanging really nicely. Um, it's got some fluidity to it, even though it's 100% wool. Um, so I think it'll be a really nice sweater. I'm excited about it to see how it comes together. Uh, okay, so... On to segment number three, pre-puppy. I still promise you puppy segment. <laughs> um, I've had some really uh, great correspondence with some folks uh, of late, and uh, one of them was, uh, I have to say, <laughs> in the mailbox, um, Mary Geiger, who sent a delightful card uh, and an email before this um, saying that she met the owner of Woolhalla Tunis, 
And uh, if you guys will remember, uh, I went to, when I was in Tempe, Arizona, I went to um, Tempe Yarn and Fiber. Uh, and because they had wool hollow tunis and I was really excited to go check out their fiber. So Mary happened to encounter the owner of wool hollow tunis um, and mentioned the podcast and uh, the, the owner of wool hollow tunis sent along a beautiful little stitch marker for Mary to send home to me, which she did. Thank you, Mary, so much. This is a really adorable little sock. You can probably see there. And then Mary, Mary went above and beyond. She sent me some beautiful CVM Corydale cross, Tunis cross, fiber to spin up. So I'm pretty excited about this. Um, when I was, uh, when I was at um, Tempe Yarn and Fiber checking out all the wool holla Tunis, I picked out some Ile de France and I picked out some Tunis, just straight Tunis. So I'm really curious to see how this cross works out because it's a CVM Corydale Tunis cross in this beautiful, rich kind of. Um, it's almost a black um, color, but it's a really deep, rich, chocolatey kind of brown black. So thank you so much, Mary. That was so sweet of you to send those along. She sent a couple other little stitch markers, <laughs> which are adorable. One says Knitting Queen on it, which I have to say I totally appreciate. So, um, and Mary's going to send in a square for the Knit Together project as well, and I'm looking forward to that. So keep those Knit Together project squares coming. Um, I did the math, and right now we have enough squares for about a six foot by six foot blanket without any kind of border. So we're getting there, and this blanket is going to be really, really cool. So if you want to get in on the Knit Together project, please um, check out knittingthestash.wordpress.com backslash KTP for all the details. And uh, if you send me a square, you can be, you'll be entered to win the giveaway of the final blanket. And I hope so many more of you get involved. I love seeing those squares come in the mail. Um, the other correspondence I've had is with the lovely Albina of uh, LB Hand Knits. And many of you might be familiar with LB Hand Knits from Instagram. She's always posting beautiful things on Instagram. And of late, she just she just uh, put out two new patterns um, with S twist wool uh, yarns, which is looks beautiful. So this I'm gonna try to do it in the light. We'll see if this works. This is the lattice sweater, which I'm guessing you guys have seen on Instagram. It is a beautiful textured cabled, not even cabled. It's it, it's it's an interesting pattern, um, but it looks a lot. It looks complicated. It looks like a cabled textured pattern. And she also has a kind of matching hat with a similar pattern, textured pattern that's on the sweater. So uh, I saw the sweater and I just like, you, <laughs> for anyone who knows me, like purple sweater with texture, beautiful, done. Um, and so I talked to her on Instagram and, and she ended up tagging me when the pattern came out and I was so excited. I went and, and got a kit for the sweater, which is coming from Ireland, yay. Um, but we started talking, and it turns out Albina and I have um, a lot in common, including the fact that she was uh, once an academic as well. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Illinois, and uh, we just got to talking about kids and knitting and just everything, and, it, and it's been a wonderful correspondence. And um, so uh, Albina's going to sponsor a giveaway, which is going to be really exciting, so you have to stay tuned for that. It'll be in the next, I think either by the next podcast or the podcast after, I'll be able to show you what the giveaway is. It is super exciting, and I think you guys are going to totally want to jump in on this one. Um, but she and I are also, um, she invited me to kind of collaborate on a test knit for her. So that is super exciting. I can't wait to get started on that. Um, and that'll be uh, over the, s the winter into the spring, and I'll talk a little. I'm, I've been cleared to talk a little bit about it on the podcast um, once we get started. So uh, it'll be a fun kind of uh, test knit for you guys to see. and. If, if you uh, have a chance, get over to Ravelry and check out those two new patterns by her. Um, they're really gorgeous. And I can tell you, I've downloaded the uh, sweater pattern and it's really well written, um, very clear, uh, a kind of pattern that um, even a kind of intermediate knitter could take on. It's a top-down sweater. It looks more complicated um, and it comes out in a kind of beautifully, com looks kind of complicated way. Um, but I think that the pattern itself is something that um, a beginning intermediate knitter could totally get in on and make a beautiful sweater for themselves. So um, check out those things. Those are coming out. Those are exciting. Um, and let's see. I've got two last things for the podcast today before we get to puppy. <laughs> 
the first one is uh, last cast I mentioned uh, a kind of remake project where uh, we would take sweaters that we acquired from big box stores or Goodwill or just old sweaters that we have that are in yarn that we don't like or something like that and, and kind of remake them in um, yarn that we love. And I got such an overwhelming response from you all uh, that I am just psyched to get started with this. So. I've opened up a thread on the Ravelry group for anyone who's interested and what I'd like to suggest is that part one, um, I'm going to try to put out a part one video sometime in January and there will be a series of videos about thinking about this remaking of a sweater. Um, and so what I'd like to get to do before I even put out part one is I'd love for anyone who's interested, you guys said so many wonderful things and had so many great projects in mind. Um, take a picture of your sweater that you want, or a garment, or whatever it is that you want to remake for this um, project. Put it in the Ravelry thread so that I can start taking a look at them. We can start talking about them and thinking about what kinds of um, yarn, what kinds of strategies, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, once we see those sweaters, it'll be uh, more concrete and we'll be able to think about what, we need, what we'd want to do to remake them. Um, I'm actually wearing one right now, another big box store sweater. It's a kind of yoked sweater that um, I love for a lot of different reasons, except that it's so short. It's so short. It's like, if I stood up, you'd see. It's like, it's probably a good two or three, four inches too short. Um, so this is another sweater that I'd love to remake in one way or another. Um, last podcast, I wore a kind of cotton sweater that I wanted to remake for a different reason. We all have these sweaters in our um, chests in our closets, so go dig around, find one or two that you'd like to um, remake for this project and put them in the Ravelry thread and we will get started in January um, working on our remake project together and that'll be a, a fun kind of collaborative project um, where we all share our knowledge and share what's going on with our sweater. So I'm really excited about that one. Um, Last, but certainly not least, before the puppy, is the giveaway. All of you who have been uh, in on the four ounce challenge for the last year have been doing amazing work. And if anyone's interested in checking out what's been going on with the four ounce challenge, you can go to the Ravelry thread. People are posting up the storm. There is spinning, there's knitting, sweaters, shawls, the, like every little bit of progress you guys are making to clear out your stash is producing these beautiful objects. Um, and I certainly love going into that thread and just seeing what you guys are making. So keep it up. We're gonna keep the four ounce challenge going for another year. And at the end of the next year, I'll do another giveaway. Um, but this year's giveaway is gonna be for a couple of patterns because the four ounce challenge is about clearing out our stash. I didn't wanna send you more stash, <laughs> but I wanna send you a way to clear out more of your stash. So I did a random number generator. We had 148 posts in the thread last year. Um, and the two winners are uh, Emony of Hopkins Studio. And Emily has been doing some beautiful hand spinning and posting about her projects in the 4-Ounce Challenge. So congratulations, Emily. I'll send you a quick email and get you a pattern um, from Ravelry. And the other winner is Cook Goalie. And I don't know your name, Cook Goalie, so I'll send you an email and uh, or a little message on Ravelry and get your pattern out to you so that you can do some more stash busting in the next um, couple of months. Um, I am right now fighting the sunbeam, which is threatening to take over the podcast. Ah! <laughs> uh, so I'm going to sign off here uh, for now and uh, take you downstairs so that you can see some uh, tink puppy time. All right. Uh, good to talk to you all today. Thanks for listening in. I hope you'll all get involved in those projects, the Knit Together Project, the Four Ounce Challenge, uh, or the Remake uh, Project that we're going to be working on the next year. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again next time. Have a great, great holiday season if I don't podcast before then. But I might. You never know. <laughs> uh, if I don't see you, have a happy holiday season. Happy Hanukkah to everyone celebrating right now. And um, a Merry Christmas coming up soon. And all the other holidays and New Year and all the goodness. So I will see you guys soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, guys. I promised you puppy time. And she is sleepy right now. This is Tink. Say hi, Tinky. <laughs> you can kind of almost hear. There she is. She's a big girl. <laughs> She's very sweet. She's learning a lot right now. And you can see her. There she is. <laughs> she will no doubt be a big feature of our lives for years to come. She's out of the knitting room right now and out of the spinning room. And Zach is watching soccer in the background. So 
I will keep this pretty short. But this is Dink. Wanna say hi, Dink? Say hi. <laughs> She's sleepy right now. I should let her go back to sleep. All right, nice to see you guys. Take care, bye.